We are live. God bless you all and welcome to the World Prayer Network. My name is Mario Bramnick. Uh, my co-host, uh, Jim Garlow, is not in this e evening. But we welcome each of you that are joining. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to share the broadcast on Facebook. And for those that are on with us, if you can uh, mute your lines. Um, earlier today, uh, Jim and I had the honor of interviewing Eli Kohanim, and Jim is yes, on. Yes, I'm, on, I'm here. <laughs> okay, why don't you say a few words of greeting? I sure will. Good to be on with you. Thank you, Mario, for covering for me. Uh, we just want to say a word about the books. Thank you for ordering, last time we were on, uh, Frank Kasher's book. Uh, let's see, 65 Wisdom Principles for Christian political activist, long title. Uh, your response was phenomenal. Your response was three times what we expected. So Frank Kaser is scurrying to get more books. So we're going to try to meet that need. Tristan Tang, who is our products manager, is working feverishly. He completed his finals for the semester, and he is working to get those out to you. Uh, we're shipping them in the fastest way we can. I just need to correct one thing I said. I said for any donation, and that's right. I, I did say order as many books as you want. And I should not, I should not have said that. <laughs> Some of you ordered tons of books and, and and didn't come close to covering the cost of the books. That's my fault. I said it. We have to stand stand behind it. We would ask, we, we, we would ask from now on. Probably my, my staff has been giving me some guidance on what I need to say. From now on, we'll probably say just order what say one or two of the books. Frank Kasher's book is still available. We'll get it to you as quickly as we can. We hope we can get many of these to you uh, by Christmas. But by all means, go ahead and order them. Yes, you can still order the calendars. Thank you, Rosemary. Go to wellversedworld.org. And there you can click down on the homepage and you'll see where to get Frank Kasher's incredible book, 65 Wisdom Principles for Christian uh, uh, act, Political Activists. And then Rosemary mentioned the calendar as well. Uh, Mario, thank you so much for letting me just share that briefly. I want, need to make that one clarification. And uh, thanks to Mario, we had an incredible interview today, and he's going to tell us all about it. Yeah, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. We introduce Ellie on the video. Uh, Terry, if you'd be kind enough, let's just go directly to uh, this morning's interview. Terry, we need volume. Terry, do we have volume? No. Terry, we need volume. <laughs> okay, Terry, are we able to? I think this calls for a shofar blast. Yes. <laughs> I, I, why don't you introduce? Uh, you shall I? We're not hearing you, Terry. We're not hearing you, Terry. Yeah, we, can, we need a blast. Need oh, go ahead, go ahead, Robert. You sound, and then we'll have. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Robert. We needed we needed that. Okay, Terry, uh, is our volume working on on this morning's interview? Thank you, Robert. We needed that. Terry, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Give me one second here. I'm having some challenges with a setting. I'll be right there. Okay, Give me one awesome. moment. You can Thank you. Uh, Mario, go ahead and take a moment to introduce Ellie, even though you do it later. I, I think it's good for uh, them to know who she is. Pretty remarkable woman. Ellie is a dear friend of ours. She uh, was a uh, deputy special envoy combating anti-Semitism at the State Department. Uh, President Trump appointed her. And um, very interesting, she is Jewish, and she was born in Iran. 
um, and has such a heart for the people of Iran, for the Middle East, for obviously for Israel in, in her battle against anti-Semitism. Uh, we are honored to have her on our board of Latino Coalition for Israel. And uh, Jim, she joined us on several of our missions, uh, the LCI mission to Guatemala, where we met uh, President Jamate, and most recently our meeting in Brazil uh, with President Bolsonaro. And um, today was just an amazing interview, the wealth of knowledge as to the Iranian threat, not only to Israel and to the Middle East, but also to us here in the United States. Terry, you break in and start the uh, video whenever you can. The interview was quite remarkable. She's very insightful. So here we hopefully will hear her now. We are very honored to have with us a dear, dear friend of ours, Eli Kohanim. Eli uh, served as Deputy Special Envoy Combating Anti-Semitism in the State Department. Uh, she was an appointee of President Trump. Uh, she's also a part, we're very honored that she's part of the Latino Coalition for Israel and has joined us on several of our missions um, with uh, uh, Jim and Rosemary. Uh, we went to Guatemala and recently to Brazil, and it's a great honor to have Eli join us tonight. Eli, thank you so much. Apostle Bramek, uh, Rosemary, Jim, it's wonderful to be with you. Great. So as everybody is hustling and bustling, preparing for Christmas, we just got through Hanukkah. We had some Hanukkah programming. You were with us for our great um, Feast of Purim uh, as a modern day Esther uh, uh, at the World Prayer Network. Um, unfortunately, um, evil doesn't stop just because it's Christmas Eve, right? So there are things that are happening right now that are of grave concern, uh, one of which is the Iranian threat um, against Israel and against um, democratic nations, even America. Um, could you just share what's going on for our viewers and then we'll have a time of Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Apostle Bromnik, as you mentioned, um, as we speak right now, the United States, and not even directly, but through, believe it or not, Russia and China are negotiating on behalf of the US with the Iranian regime in Vienna, in the Vienna talks. And the Biden administration is really acting in a very desperate way to get the Iranians back into the uh, 2015 Iran deal, uh, the JCPOA. And, uh, and President Trump ripped up that deal because it was a terrible deal to begin with. It, uh, the major flaw was that it put the Iranians on a pathway to a nuclear bomb in 2030. And, uh, and every day that goes by, the Iranians are that much closer to a nuclear bomb. Um, and, and so besides, besides the fact that, again, it, it, it allowed the Iranians a pathway to legal, uh, you know, legal, not against international law, the 2050, 2015 Iran deal did that. But it also didn't stop the Iranians in their terror activity, the terror proxy activity, which undermines every country in the Middle East. So whether you're talking about their proxies, the Houthis in Yemen, which are attacking Saudi Arabia all the time, whether you're talking about Hamas, which just rained down 4,000 missiles on Israel, whether you're talking about Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is also uh, constantly uh, conducting attacks against Israel, um, whether you're talking about Hezbollah and Lebanon, which has destroyed the country of Lebanon and also is constantly attacking Israel. So those are Iran's terror proxies. And, and that was the other major flaw of the 2015 deal was that it didn't deal with Iran's terror proxy activity. It also didn't deal with Iran's intercontinental ballistic missile development. So those were all of the original flaws of the deal. And that, that again was the reason why the Trump administration walked away from, from that horrible deal. And we waged the maximum pressure campaign, which is considered the strongest uh, sanctions campaign in all of history that any country leveraged against another. And the result of that was that at the end of the Trump administration, the Iranian regime had only $4 billion in accessible current uh, currency, foreign currency reserves, according to the International Monetary Fund. So that's where uh, the Biden administration came in. And since that time, 
they have allowed the Chinese to buy Iranian oil. And, uh, and so now they have billions more accessible to them. And they use that money just to fund terror. You know, the people on the streets in Iran, they're still poor, they're still hungry. There have been protests in Iran all across the country because they're thirsty. They don't even have water in many parts of the country. Farmers don't have water to irrigate with. And, uh, and so while the regime has all this money now made available to them, all that they do is line their own pockets and fund terrorism. That is the state of affairs that we're in right now. And, uh, and so we see that Israel at the same time is sharing intelligence, uh, according to reports in the news media, public reports, that the regime is now getting closer and closer to, uh, to uranium enrichment, which would give them nuclear bomb status. And, uh, and so with that backdrop, what we've seen is that Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, um, the president of the country, Isaac Herzog, and even the head of the Mossad, Barnea, who typically, you know, Mossad is Israel's uh, intelligence agency, and those guys are usually very quiet, they don't make public statements. He even made a statement last week saying that the Mossad will never allow Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. And um, he was just in the United States, as was the prime minister. And so what we're seeing right now is that at the highest levels of Israeli leadership, they're all telling the Biden administration that the US cannot allow the Iranians to reach a nuclear bomb, nuclear weapon status. And we are not seeing yet a real positive response from the Biden administration in return, in response to the Israelis. And that's very worrying. Um, I think all of us should be worried, certainly for the safety and security of the Jewish state of Israel, the Iranian regime, the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei himself has said over and again that he wants to eliminate, quote unquote, eliminate Israel, what he calls the, quote, the Zionist entity. And, uh, and we know that the Iranians constantly are wishing death to Israel, and they're very on the record. They don't hide it their desire to quote unquote eliminate Israel. But also as Americans, we should be concerned for our own national security because Iran through Hezbollah has a presence in Latin America. They have a very close relationship with the leadership in Venezuela. They have a presence in the tri-border area in Latin America, and that's right at our doorstep. And so I don't think it takes much imagination to think about that the, this regime, if once it has a nuclear bomb capability and it already has feet on the ground in Latin America, what does this mean for our own security? And so we really, all of us need to be pushing members of Congress. We need to be pushing on the Biden administration to protect our own national security interests. And we cannot allow this regime to achieve the nuclear weapons capability, which they are on the march towards. Um, thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions, Ellie. Um, number one, in your estimation, how how soon, how close are we to Iran, Iran becoming nuclear capable? You know, I'm not I'm not an expert on that. I can tell you what the different reporting has been. Um, I just wrote an op ed in Newsweek with my colleague at the Center for Security Policy, Victoria Coates. And in that piece, we quote news reports that Israel's intelligence has shared intelligence with America that uh, that the Iranians are taking steps to achieve 90 percent uranium enrichment which would put them at nuclear bomb status. And, um, and also we have seen some people in the Biden administration make statements along the lines of um, that the Iranians are conducting activity which is beyond civilian use. So it seems like uh, timeline is, is speeding up. And I think that's the reason why we're seeing so much um, diplomatic flurry 
of visits from high-level Israelis to the United States. So the Israeli prime minister, the Israeli foreign minister, the head of the Mossad, all of this activity, they've all been coming here and meeting with um, as high level meetings as they can get with the Biden administration. And, and I've also been hearing that in Israeli media, there's a lot of talk about what's going on with the Iranian threat and that they've even been conducting drills in Israel. Uh, my friends in Israel, and I know we all on this uh, call have many friends in Israel who probably can confirm this, that they're seeing a lot of activity over the skies in Israel. So, um, so I think that the Israelis are definitely preparing and I, I would not be surprised if we see something develop very soon. Um, I think I may have asked you this before. We, we saw similar um, policy in the Obama administration, now the Biden administration taking it to a new level. What can be the Biden administration's calculus in this is it absolute ignorance or is there an intentionality in their actions in supporting iran to become nuclear nuclear capable i i, I can't understand giving them every benefit of the doubt how could this help america well, it can't help America, and that's the issue. It just cannot help America. Um, you know, I just detailed that this would be a threat to our own national security, uh, and also it undermines all of our relationships with our allies in the Middle East, North Africa. So the Saudis, again, they have been the victims of the the Iranian proxies, the Houthis in Yemen are uh, are consistently attacking Saudi civilian sites and Saudi assets. And Saudi Arabia has been a long time friend and ally of the United States. So this administration is, is just basically abandoning our allies. They also are signaling to, um, to countries like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, who just made peace with Israel uh, because the Trump administration really encouraged it and brokered those peace deals to really try to create a stable region. And, uh, and we're also abandoning the, the Emiratis. And so we're seeing that um, even uh, military equipment that we had promised to the Emirates uh, as part of the Abraham Accords, it looks like the Biden administration is backtracking. And I just saw a report yesterday that the Emiratis are possibly buying this equipment elsewhere. So, so none of this is good. None of this is good for the United States. None of this is good for the Middle East, North Africa region. And, you know, as much as I know that Americans don't have the appetite for military engagement and and everyone wants their troops back home, what I can tell you is that if if the United States um, empowers an enemy state like Iran and with this disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal where we left behind $80 billion of our own military equipment for the Taliban, all of this stuff is creating a situation where we're just gonna wind up getting drawn right back into the Middle East. It's all gonna come back to bite us. And I, and I hate to predict negative things. As you know, I, I, uh, I always hope and pray for the American people and for the best and for all of our safety and security. But I can't help but note that these policies are, are really just ultimately putting all of us back in danger. Could you address uh, the recent news that uh, the U.S. denied Israel's request for refueling tankers? I think it happened yesterday or the day before. Can you explain to us what happened? Exactly right. So the Israelis requested um, that that this the, these uh, tankers, which are, if I understand correctly, they're kind of um, they have the ability to to fly greater distances without needing refueling. And so, in a scenario where Israel would want to um, take out a nuclear site in Iran, they would need this kind of equipment and the Biden administration has denied their request to fast track it. So, uh, so that means that the Israelis won't have this equipment that they need. In that Newsweek op-ed that I just uh, mentioned that, I, that was just published by, by Newsweek that I wrote with Victoria Coates, I also made the case that the United States should give Israel uh, another piece of important military equipment that they need, and those are bunker busters. 
So um, this this year, I believe, was the 40th anniversary of the Israeli uh, attack on Iraq's on Saddam Hussein's nuclear site, the Osirak nuclear site. And uh, as you all may know, Israel also took out uh, Assad's uh, nuclear site in uh, in Syria. And so what happened was when the Iranians observed that Israel has had this ability to take out nuclear sites, they took lessons from what happened with Iraq and Syria. And so what they did is they started to build, first of all, they spread their nuclear sites all across the country. And then second, they started to build their nuclear sites underground, very deep underground. And so the Fordo nuclear site is one of them where it's very deep underground. And the only country in the world that has the equipment, these bunker busters, as they call them, uh, that has the ability to actually penetrate into these deep underground nuclear facilities is the United States. And so, you know, look, the Israelis have always felt that it's America's role to take on the Iranian nuclear threat, that this is this is kind of bigger than them. And it's really about world peace. And I agree with that assessment. It is about world peace and it is America's role to enforce world peace in that way. But if the Biden administration does not want to play that role for whatever reason, then the least they can do is give Israel this equipment. So, um, so this is another hope that we have is that, uh, that perhaps this will be something that the Biden administration will give to Israel. What happened two days ago, their denial of the U.S. refueling tankers is any indication um, there, it does not appear that the Biden administration has any appetite to grant Israel anything it needs uh, uh, to defend itself from a nuclear strike, which then leaves Israel on its own. Israel, as it did in Iraq and Syria, cannot allow Iran to be uh, nuclear capable. I, I don't know if you can, just from your experience, if Israel has to take Iran on on its own, what does that look like? What kind of retaliation may come back to Israel? What are we looking at in terms of just Israel and Iran, if it doesn't uh, go into a more global type of war? Well, as I said earlier, you know, I, I always hope and pray for uh, for good things, but uh, this would not be a great scenario. What uh, what I understand from Israeli defense officials is that you're talking about a multi front war at that point. So we know already that Hamas and Hezbollah are on Israel's borders. What we saw also with the most recent uh, May conflict with Hamas was that unfortunately a lot of Israeli Arabs and Palestinian Arabs also started to conduct attacks within the country, right, where they were rioting and they were burning down uh synagogues and other buildings and they were attacking israelis on the streets so what you're talking about is a potential where israel has uh to be taking military action against iran while at the same time dealing with hamas hezbollah and even palestinians and israeli arabs on the streets of its own cities um it you know it sounds very dire and uh and i certainly, again, hope that even if the Biden administration wouldn't want to stand by our ally Israel, that the American people would make sure that we do stand by our ally Israel. And the other point to make here is that, um, you know, the Iranian threat is, again, it's not just against Israel, it's against really the entire region, entire, you know, that entire neighborhood. And so again, I would say that the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, even the Omanis, um, perhaps the Qataris, all these countries would not be too happy to see um, Iran gain any kind of further strength uh, than that they already have. So, um, so I think that that it would really I would have to hope again that the American people would force our government to do the right thing in that kind of scenario. So practically for the people on the call, we're after this presentation or next, we're going to be praying specifically for Israel, for this situation, for our leadership in Washington. What can our listeners do practically if you can just map out the action plan? Well, I think um, everyone should be calling their members of Congress. That's that's really uh, very important right now. 
uh, you know, just just call your your uh, members in the House of Representatives in the United States Senate. They need to hear from you. And I know for a fact that um, in those congressional offices, the staffers log every single phone call that they make. And so it's really, really important for them to hear from every constituent possible that uh, that we need to stand by Israel right now, that we know that this threat is a serious threat. And so um, and so that's very important. And I would say that for people, even if you live in a Democratic district, you know, even if you're in a blue state, make that phone call because it's important for them to hear from from everyone in their constituency um, and not assume that just because they're in a blue state that that the citizens in a blue state don't care about Israel. I think, again, it's really important for everybody to make those calls. And uh, and then, you know, at the same time, you know, we could make an effort. I know all of us are, are pessimistic about the Biden administration, but I think to make our voices heard loud and clear, whether it's to the mainstream media, whether it's social media, um, through our networks, uh, through the churches, we really need to activate and really try to get our voices heard that we want our government to stand by Israel right now. My last question, and then Jim has a few questions. Um, what is in our mainland? What kind of Hezbollah uh, capabilities, terror cells or other Iranian proxy cells if they wanted to do damage uh, to us here in America? So again, I, I think that that would, um, that would come from, from their presence in Latin America. So the, the tri-border area is the borders between Argentina, um, Paraguay, Uruguay. That is the area that is known to be an area where um, Hezbollah has presence, where they are they are conducting an, a lot of um, drug dealing activity, money laundering activity, um, and also selling arms and so on. It's it's kind of like a, a lawless wild west in that in that area, and and we know that the Iranians have conducted successful horrible attacks in the area before because if you look at the 1994 AMIA bombing the bombing of the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires in Argentina you know that that's uh, th that traces back to Iran and that was the deadliest uh, anti-semitic attack that took place in the Americas so um so they already have a track record of conducting these kinds of attacks now the amia they conducted it in argentina but again if you look at the iranians right now they're they're constantly developing their ballistic miss missiles they're developing their drones um all you have to you know do, again doesn't take much imagination to say you take that that ability which they already have you take their presence in latin america which is already there um, and again, they've now have warm relations with Venezuela and uh, we see oil going from Iran to Venezuela and gold from Venezuela to Iran. So more penetration of, of Latin America. Um, all of that, you know, it, it doesn't take much to, to understand that this is a threat to, to the mainland as well. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, Jim, back to you. Uh, internally within Iran, what can you tell us about the uprisings against the government? I know they're profoundly controlled and can't do much, but are the uprisings getting anywhere close to critical mass that could potentially topple the power structure currently? Jim, I really appreciate your asking that question because you know, for the audience who may not know, I was born in Iran myself and I was the State Department's first Iranian born envoy so um, the people of Iran are, are really dear to my heart, and I, I appreciate the question because I really want to differentiate between the people of Iran and the regime. The, the people of Iran have over and over again rejected the regime's hateful ideology. They've re rejected the attempts that the regime has made 
to uh, indoctrinate them against Israel, against America. And we see evidence of that every day uh, on social media. They reach out to, to people like myself. I get attempts all the time on social media from people inside Iran saying, be our voice, help us. We love America, we love Israel. I, I get this feedback all the time. And you see it in, in things like, um, there have been videos that have been shared where the, the Iranian regime has painted the American flag and the Israeli flag on the streets so that people will walk on these flags. And we've seen videos where the Iranians are actually jumping over these flags not to step on them. So um, so the people um, are, are really heavily oppressed by this regime. And we've seen um, different waves of protests. So in 2019-20, there was a huge wave of millions and millions of people, Iranian people took to the streets. And unfortunately, what the regime did was they started to use live ammunition, live fire against the people. And at the time in the, in the Trump State Department, we had reports that at, at, at around 1,500 people were murdered in these street protests. Um, since then, the Biden administration has tried to revise those numbers and make it seem less. But uh, but the reality is that that's uh, that's about the kind of numbers that we we saw at the time reporting of how many were killed. So, Jim, to your question, um, when people go out in the streets and protest, they know they're literally taking their lives uh, the, in their hands, and and they could you know go out and and not come home at the end of the night. Um, and so that's a very, very difficult situation. But sometimes I think that the people in Iran are just pushed to the point where they have no choice. And so what I was saying earlier, uh, we saw in about a week ago, there were um, protests in the city of Esfahan because people just have no water uh, because the regime is mismanaging resources. And the same thing right now, just yesterday, there were huge protests by teachers in Iran and they were demanding the release of some teachers who've been held in prison. And they were also demanding their salaries and their wages. And so I do think there's always the potential that these protests could really pick up steam and, uh, and spread all across the country. And I'm always hopeful that the Iranian people will one day take back uh, my beautiful homeland, the country that I was born in. And I am very, very hopeful for them. Well, uh, we'll we'll agree in prayer for that with, with you. Uh, a question on the political landscape as it relates to Congress. When you encourage people to con contact their congressman or congresswoman, uh, there's 435 members of the House of Representatives, 100 senators, and split very evenly between parties, both both houses right now. That being the case, in your best guesstimate, what percentage of Republicans are standing with the Trump doctrine, and what percentage of Democrats are wedded to the current Biden doctrine? Jim, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I think that all of us tracking the news, we're kind of familiar with. Um, we know that the Democrats, there's a, there's a radical leftist fringe. Uh, people like AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and of course, they're they're big supporters of of the enemies of the United States, like Iran. But um, but then there are some of the more moderate Democrats, people like Joe Manchin, um, and and a few others, um, Josh Gottheimer, Ted Deutsch, um, sometimes Ben Cardin. So some of some of these folks, I think, um, sometimes do push back against uh, this lunatic uh, lunatic wave that's taken over the Democratic Party in, in too many ways. In terms of Republicans, I mean, most of the Republicans would not vote for anything that would strengthen or empower the Iranian regime. So I do imagine that um, things do kind of fall on party lines. But at the same time, I, I really do encourage people to pick up the phone and get get their voices heard to their to their members of Congress, because I think it's a mistake for people to feel that if they have a Democrat member of Congress that represents their area, not to give them a call and not to try at all. I think it's really, really important for every member of Congress to hear from their constituents and to know that we care about these issues. If we don't call and we don't try, they'll never know that we care. And even in the case of Republicans who are standing rock solid on the right issue, a call of affirmation 
uh, to the congressman's office is, is very, very, very good. Do a role play right now for our audience uh, of just simply one sentence, two sentences, three sentences of what you would say if you call the congressman's office, what would be your request of that congressman? And I want our people to hear the phrasing so they can emulate that as they call their members of Congress. Well, I, th I think, you know, uh, the conversation or the call could be something along the lines of uh, dear so and so, you know, I am, I'm Ellie Kohanim and I live in, you know, XYZ zip code, you know, in your district. And I'm calling because I want you to know that I care as an American, I care deeply about the United States supporting our ally Israel. We know right now the Iranians are threatening Israel. I would like you to vote uh, to, to give Israel whatever military support and whatever, whatever support we can give Israel right now, especially as it relates to Iran. Very, very helpful. My, my, uh, the first two questions I was going to ask, and Mario actually asked them, and the, and the first one was, how close? And you've alluded to that already. And of course, that's the big question. How close is Iran to nuclear capability? But the second one that Mario asked, I, I, I guess I'm rephrasing it. It boggles my mind on, on the Biden's administration, lack of awareness to the critical issue of intercontinental ballistic missile capability. I, I know that no one can accuse the leftists and progressives of being, of being rational or logical, but it is beyond my capability to grasp why it wouldn't be conspicuously ob obvious that Biden and his cohorts would be vociferously opposed to any nation like Iran having the capacity to destroy us. Why is that not immediately apparent, except the, the only answer I know is the spiritual blindness that comes from people who walk away from the truth. But can you give any insight from your perspective on that would explain why they would be so calloused and unable to see the self-destruction they're bringing to our own nation? Jim, there, there is no, there is no good reason. There's no answer. And, and you know what you just said reminds me of years ago. And it's exhausting to think that we've been having this conversation about the Iranian threat for so many years now. But years ago, Israel's then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I remember he was speaking to an APAC policy conference, and he said about the intercontinental ballistic missiles he said listen the iranians already have the the range of missiles that they need to attack israel but now they're talking now they're developing intercontinental ballistic missiles icbms and as they say in the commercial this buds for you this is what netanyahu said this buds for you and what i mean my friends is that the icbms can reach america so this isn't about israel this is about america and so, you know, I remember this really stayed with me that this, you know, this funny thing that, that Netanyahu came up with, this buds for you, was to try to help everyone understand, you know, really stay in your head. In it. And it has stayed in my mind all these years. What he was trying to alert us to all the way back then. And to this day, um, we're, you know, again, under an American administration that is refusing to acknowledge that this is, this buddy is for us. It's, it's really, you know, it's intended towards us. And as much as the Iranian regime, they call Israel the little Satan. Well, guess who they consider big Satan? They consider America big Satan. Yeah. This last question I have is probably impossible to answer, but if you can climb inside of the Israeli mind defensively right now, Mossad, et cetera, and the IDF, uh, or would we expect, based upon what we know from Iran, for the offenses that they, offensives that they take to be kind of like what was happening not too long ago when mysteriously nuclear plants were blowing up and no explanation? How is this happening? Or would it be a more all-out frontal attack, aerial bombing, the, the uh, bunker busters, etc., if they had access to those? Which, and if it's the latter, would that not then automatically pull in a number of nations uh, in, in, into, into war? So kind of assess for me what you think the strategy might be in the thinking of Israelis right now, given where the Iran capability is. Well, Jim, the, the Israelis have been incredibly successful, as you're, as you're referring to, uh, to all the sabotage. Um, and so we've seen that. 
uh, over and again, where, like you said, there have been these mysterious explosions at different nuclear sites. There was also the Stuxnet virus that uh, that was in coordination, apparently, with the United States years ago. And so they they have been, you know, I mean, I think incredibly successful with the sabotage campaign. And it's always hard to assess how much they've set back the Iranian effort each time with each sabotage. But the message that I think we're hearing loud and clear from, from the highest levels of the Israeli government, and again, this is the prime minister, the president, the head of the Mossad, all of them, is that they they really seem to be saying pretty bluntly to the Biden administration, don't negotiate a weak and pathetic deal with the Iranians, don't let up sanctions and have a plan B ready. And plan B obviously means a military option. And what the Israelis are asking America is, uh, is that we should really, really be showing Iran that America would take military action if they're forced to do so. And, uh, and so I think that this is still, still the Israeli hope, is that America will ultimately come through and do the right thing. Now, Jim, I have to say one, one other um, idea on, on this question, which I'm seeing a lot of people in the Jewish world raise this issue which is that you know after the holocaust i think one of the lessons for the holocaust for jews was that at the end of the day we really could not depend on the world for the safety and security of, of the jewish people right so we saw that uh in most of europe there was collaboration with the nazis there were certainly exceptions and and righteous gentiles um and and i know in, in your own beautiful family there's this incredible association with that um but but unfortunately sadly we saw the vast majority of europe collaborate with uh with the nazis and and so it led to the to the murder of six million jews and then we also saw that even after all this no country would allow and during the holocaust and and even in the period afterwards no country was allowing jews refuge and so jews had nowhere to go even if they were trying to escape the holocaust they couldn't get into another country so at the time you know i think from that experience, there was this understanding that the Jewish state of Israel couldn't rely on anybody else for its own security. And in fact, Menachem Begin, uh, the, one of the former prime ministers of Israel and, and the prime minister who conducted the attack on, on Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear site, is the is the um, creator of what they call the Begin Doctrine. And the Begin Doctrine is that Israel will never allow another Holocaust to happen again. And so ultimately, Jim, I think that what the Israeli authorities really need to understand is that um, as much as all of us hope and pray that the United States will be the, the moral and rightful ally of Israel that we should be, at the end of the day, I think the Israelis need to really understand the Begin Doctrine and really understand that Israel's security is their responsibility and they need to do whatever they need to do to keep the Jewish people safe so that they can stick to the Begin Doctrine and never allow another Holocaust to take place again. You are eloquent. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask Rosemary just to pray over you and pray over the situation. Uh, but uh, before we go back to Mario, I said my last question, but I, you are so eloquent. You, you keep stirring more questions. I, I'd like to uh, ask one more. Given the fact that Israel has the awkward situation of a shared prime ministership going from one to another, um, do both of them, my question obviously has to do with where it's going in the future, not who the current prime minister is, but once it's shared and, and laterals over, uh, does that second prime minister share with the same intensity the concern over Iran? Jim, you know, that, that, that's that been the only, um, you know, I shouldn't say the only, but it's, it's been one of the hopeful signs coming out of Israel. Many of us were very concerned when we saw this new coalition government that, um, that they wouldn't show seriousness towards the Iranian issue. And we are seeing uh, we are seeing seriousness in their uh, in their statements again in the flurry of diplomatic activity in their travel to the United States and their statements. So um, so so far it seems like that is in place. The question I think is um, is what happens next and if they will show a, a real determination. 
Um, and, and the reality is that if the Israeli government, I think, makes a decision to conduct a military strike or to, to take a, some sort of a, uh, of, a, of a really serious action against Iran, they probably will need a national unity government. So I, I think that that's probably what they would try to do in that kind of scenario. You are eloquent and you are gracious, very knowledgeable. Rosemary, you want to pray into this situation and then we turn it back to Mario. Abba, Father, we're so grateful for the fact that you have a covenant with your people, the Jewish people, and with the land of Israel. And as its defender, you will be faithful to intervene and to show your right hand of power, your magnificent um, display of your authority and protection over the Jewish people, even at this hour where you're testing all the nations. I thank you for Ellie, Lord God, and I thank you that she has been raised up, called by you for such a time as this, and Lord, that she is communicating your heart, your word, your purposes to the nation so that we also can be in alignment with you and and that we too father will be delivered from judgment we just thank you for this great mercy and i pray for ellie lord god that you continue to surround her with your angelic host we call upon the forces by the captain of the host to um, enlist their their resources around her and all of her family members that lord that um, you would be a wall of fire around her, that your glory would be within her. And even as we listen to her, we know, Father, that her words are coming straight from your heart. And so, Father, we honor the woman of God and thank you for her and, and ask you to continue to bless, honor, and promote her in the days ahead for the great treasure she is, both to Israel and to the United States of America and to all the nations amen 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 oh wow thank you so much i'm i'm so touched right now thank you rosemary amen we so appreciate you this is this is stunning that you're here able to share with us truth and the heart of hashem that we can join together with you and do what we need to do to uh, fulfill our part well, I just want to say that I'm so, so grateful for all of my Christian friends, for everybody who's joined us and, and uh, you know, Israel deeply needs all of you and your support. The Jewish people need you and your support. And, uh, and every, you know, again, Jim, Rosemary, Pastor Bromick, you, you all know how much uh, I appreciate each of you. And again, all my Christian friends. So God bless you all for everything that you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. Mario, back to you. Ali, thank you so much as always. Absolutely stellar whenever you are with us in church or any other time to brief us. I want to end with the scriptures. You were talking, and you could just imagine the government, the average Israeli, the feeling of being all alone. And um, I felt to just share this scripture because God is always with Israel. Psalm 131. I will lift up my eyes to the mountain where does my help come my help comes from the lord the maker of heaven and earth he will not allow your foot to slip he who watches you will not slumber indeed he who watches israel will neither slumber nor sleeps the lord watches over you the lord is your shade at your right hand the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going from now and forevermore. Just felt to share the importance of this King David Psalm of God is our resource in times like this and our protector. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Thank you so much, Ellie. Uh, blessings to you and your family. And amen, amen. Thank you, thank you. Jim, did you want to say something before we go to prayer? No, I think I think we should go directly to prayer. That was uh, 
we just interviewed her this morning, uh, but that was so powerful to hear it again. And boy, she laid out so many things for us to pray for. We know where to where to target. So let's go for it now. Cyril, if you can please lead us in prayer. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jim and Rosemary, for the opportunity. And thank you for Judy for coordinating. And Mario, thank you for facilitating. So I just want to read a scripture. It was a tremendous presentation and the interview. Uh, and it, she gave a wonderful summary uh, of what is happening. The Lord reminded me Psalm 2. So I'm going to read a few verses and then we can pray. Uh, uh, Psalm 2 is in the context of the kingdom of the Messiah, but somehow the Lord reminded me. So there is a context in this situation. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, mm -hmm. let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And let's move to verse 9 and 10. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this wonderful evening, Lord. Thank you for giving us a summary of what is happening in the Holy Land compared to what is happening in Iran and other nations in the Middle East, Lord. So, Lord, we give Israel into your mighty hands. And, Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem uh, today, Lord. Nothing is impossible for you. All things are possible for those who believe, Lord. We put our faith together and Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord, and the peace in Israel, Lord Jesus. You will do it, Lord Jesus. Raise up mighty intercessors to pray for this situation, Lord. We know that Iran is wanting to destroy Israel, but Lord, all their uh, vain plans will be destroyed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And like the potter's vessels, Lord, those kings and that vessels will be broken, Lord Jesus. And their plans will be broken in Jesus' mighty name, Master. We believe that all the vain plottings of these kings from around the world will not succeed, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Lord, it is dependent on the intercessors, even as we agree and pray, as we ask you to do this miracle for us, Lord. We thank you and praise you. Lord, we pray that the plans for the nuclear capability will not prosper, Lord. Master, we pray you will send confusion in the enemy's camp, Master. And every plan of darkness be rebuked in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Master. We pray for wisdom for America, Lord Jesus. We pray that our administration will understand what is happening. And Lord, we pray that you will remove the leaders that are against Israel and that we'll stand at, with our allies, Lord. We will stand with Israel, Master. We thank you and praise you because we must stand with Israel, Lord, so that we can be blessed because those who stand with Israel will be blessed. And that is the promise given to Abraham, Lord Jesus. So we must stand with Israel. So Lord, if there needs to be a change in leadership in America, so be it, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord. We pray that this will be shared with everyone in America, especially those who are aligning with Israel and who support Israel, Lord. We pray that many will be calling their congressmen to bring this to the forefront, Master. We thank you and praise you. Do a mighty work for Israel, Master. Do a mighty work, Lord Jesus. We pray for Iran as well, as we know that the gospel is being preached in Iran, Lord Jesus, through satellite, Master. We pray that many of the leaders will receive you as their personal savior. Let there be a mighty move in Iran, Lord Jesus. Let there be a change of heart, Master. You can change the hearts, Master. Change the heart of stone to a heart of flesh so that the word of God can be sown there, even as the gospel is being preached, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Thank you for the strong underground church in Iran, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Master. Bless Israel, Lord. We pray 
that, that there will be millions of Jews who will be saved, Lord Jesus. Let the gospel be preached. Let the light of the gospel shine. Let them know that the Messiah has already come and that is Jesus Christ. Let there be a revelation given to our Jewish brothers and sisters, Lord. Thank you, Master. Do a mighty work, Lord. And even as we pray, we know that Iran will not become nuclear. There will be confusion in the enemy's camp and they will not be able to achieve that objective law. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Rita, if you can please pray. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes, thank you. Father, we thank you tonight for what we've heard. You are getting the truth out. You are exposing. You are bringing forth the things that need to bring forth, Father. We thank you for people, warriors like Ellie Kohanin, that she has the favor, she has the might, she has the mindset that you are that you are promoting her, that you're moving her forth, Father. Open doors for her to go out and speak the truth like never before. We thank you, Lord, that the angels do have charge over her and keep her in all her ways. We pray for wisdom and revelation for her, Father. We thank you for this mighty woman of God that you set, that you set for such a time as this, Lord. Father, your word says that you are zealous for Zion and that we, the people of the United States of America, uh, know and understand how imperative it is that we stand with Israel, that we are standing shoulder to shoulder with them, that we are supporting Israel, Lord. There's not just a halfway, it has to be all the way in the name of Jesus. So I ask you tonight, for those on the call to be awakened with discernment and wisdom and understanding to know what this time is and what this season is. That it is a time that we say yes to what your word says about Israel. That we stand with them, that we let the members of Congress know we the people are speaking in the name of Jesus. Hear what God is saying loud and clear tonight, Lord, that we must. It's not a maybe. It's not maybe, maybe, no, no. It is yes, yes, yes. So I thank you tonight and declare over America, we are awakening to what you were doing in this time, that you are moving and shaking and getting our attention, Lord. So those that haven't had the awakening, wake up now in the name of Jesus, Lord. So we thank you. We celebrate Israel. We declare that we stand firm, Lord, that we are with Israel. And we even come into agreement, Lord, with some of the points made as far as just giving them the armaments and the support in the natural that they need. And that we awaken also to what the influence of Hezbollah is doing in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, in Latin America. You heard it. You heard the truth spoken. So now you're responsible. Father, we thank you. We give you praise and honor tonight, Lord, that we're part of what you're doing. We say yes. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. And Father, we thank you tonight that we can uh, come to you in prayer and agree together. We ask, Lord, that your will would be done. And we know that in the country of Iran, there are believers. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to them, even in the night watches, that you would visit them, that their spirits would be open to receive from you, and that you would surround them, Lord, during this time, and those in Israel as well and in Latin America. Lord, we ask that you would stay the movement of the evil one through uh, the Iranians and that you would foil the plans of the evil one. We pray that you would continue to protect your people in Iran and Israel and even in Latin America and that you would move in our lives here in the United States, that we would come to a place of recognizing what's going on. And even if we don't have the information, Lord, that we would uh, be able to receive from you your revelation about how to pray, how to intercede, 
and that we would agree together with you, Lord. We ask during this time uh, in December, as we finish out this year, that you would move by the power of your spirit in ways that we can't even imagine, and that you would move and bring your light and revelation to these uh, people in the countries. We bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name, with a greater sense of your presence, your peace, your protection in such a time as this. We pray that you would motivate uh, the folks here in the United States and bring out uh, the connections with the senators and congressmen. And Lord, that there would be divine appointments and that the timing would be according to your will, Lord, that you would move powerfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Janine, if you can please pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the promises that are in your word and in Jeremiah, where you promised in Jeremiah 15, 20. I take this promise for Israel in particular. They will fight against you like a, an attacking army. But I will make you as secure as a fortified wall of bronze. They will not conquer you, for I am with you to protect you and to rescue you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will certainly keep you safe from the wicked men. I will rescue out of their cruel hands. Thank you, Lord, for, for your word that your word is true and you fulfill your word, Lord. And you say in chapter 30, verse 10, so do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, says the Lord, for I will bring you, this is the promise you fulfilled. I'll bring you home again from distant lands and your children will return from their exile. Israel returned to a life of peace and quiet, and no one will terrorize them. For I am with you, and I will save you, says the Lord. And Jesus, I just thank you for this, for the promise of your word. You have your special covering over the nation of Israel. And we pray for the threat, Father, that looms so great with, with Iran. We thank you, Jesus, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in pulling down strongholds. And Jesus, tonight, I just take kingdom authority, and we pull down these strongholds that have risen up against the nation of Israel, against the United States, and we just pray, Father, that you will, you're the one that puts in kings and takes out kings, and we just pray, Father, that you will work in a supernatural way in the nation, in, in the United States, I pray. And Jesus, I just thank you tonight that we can stand firm in the promises that you have given to us in your word. And I thank you, Jesus, that you say, I am with you and I will save you. And we thank you for this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Back to you, Jim. I want to thank you all for, for staying on when we have such somber topics. It's Christmas. We don't like to introduce the heavier topics and more difficult topics. You know, at the same time, we have to talk about these things, what's going on in our globe. We have a number of excellent uh program's coming. One of those uh, I want to talk about. Mario, is this a good time to talk about what we're going to be covering the next few weeks? Yes, please. Uh, Rosemary, take a moment and talk about Jenna Lewinsky and Jacob's Spotted Sheep. Mm -hmm. um, Jenna is a, a Jewish woman from South Africa, moved to Canada, and from there gathered uh, the remnant, a remnant of the, of the spotted sheep, the ones that Jacob developed with with the Lord's miraculous the, help, descendants from descendants those. from um, the book of Genesis that were then brought into Israel, but then dispersed with the Jews, and after the destruction of the temple. But as the people are being regathered and the land is being restored, and the the desert is blossoming and the plants are are being replanted the vines and the trees, so are the livestock. And so this particular story is a real life biblical um, drama adventure of a, a woman of faith who heard God's call to return Jacob's sheep, not only to Israel, but to the very fields of Ruth and Boaz, to the tower of the flock, the Migdal Eder, the site of Messiah's first birth, and in preparation for his return. So these, this is not fake news. This is, this is the most recent up-to-date frontline biblical news, which will give you much hope and excitement as you see God preparing his way for his coming. 
And the great expectation we all have as believers for um, what's about to take place. So we invite you to hear the story of Jenna Lewinsky, the true life drama, the and become involved in helping, helping in this effort uh, to restore the land of Israel, its people, its flocks, and its produce. I think some of the most thrilling uh, aspects about what God is fulfilling right now uh, is taking place in Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes to Jerusalem if they visit there. Everybody goes to Sea of Galilee, and those are awesome. But oftentimes people miss what's happening in Samaria and what's happening in Judea. A young woman in Judea named Jenna Lewinsky, tune in and find out the rest of the story, how she's actually fulfilling scripture, this Orthodox Jew, and then a family, a husband and wife, 11 children, now many of them now are married, 26 grandchildren up in Samaria, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy from 2,700 years ago, happening right now. These are remarkable things. So the Jenna Lewinsky story and Jacob's spotted sheep, when I, I'll, I'll be honest, when I first heard about it, some of our friends were talking about it, it was a yawner to me. Why would I care about that? Rosemary wanted us to go meet Jenna and see when we were over there. And I was taken. And so we have now been with her numbers of times. Every time. Yeah, every time we, we go, we, we go it's there. because God saves the best for last. <laughs> so his, his most precious um, choice locations of the altars, the wells, the pillars, the visitation sites are on the road of the patriarch. On, in the mountains of Israel along its backbone, Highway 60. And here, the modern day miracles of, of God's faithfulness and redemption are taking place. So we wanna bring you right on location where tourism hasn't been established or, or centuries of religious uh, uh, buildings and artifacts. This is um, recently revealed locations of huge biblical significance because the Lord loves this land and his eye never leaves it. You'll see a flock of the descendants, DNA tested, from Jacob's spotted sheep from Genesis 35. Check out Genesis 35 verses 19, 20, and 21. When Rachel died, his wife died, and he buried her, and then he camped at the Migdal Ader. It's in your Bible, Genesis 35. Migdal Ader is the location of Genesis spotted sheep. But I want you to see there, Migdal Ader stands for Watchtower of the Flock. That's the literal translation. It's in your Bible in Hebrew, uh, transliterated Migdal Ader. It's also in Micah 4 8. In Micah 5 2, there's a prophecy where Jesus is going to be born. In Micah 4 8, he prophesies with greater specificity where in Bethlehem or right by Bethlehem, Jesus is going to be born. So the next uh, three sessions or so, we're going to be focusing on the Migdal Ader during this Christmas season. And as we get ready to enter the new year, I want to talk to you about the blood covenant. The blood covenant is the key phrase for understanding all the Bible. Why am I focusing on that? There, there are hundreds of scriptures, strong Contention here, hundreds of scriptures will make sense only if we understand the blood covenant, the steps of the ancient ceremony, the ancient blood covenant, covenant ceremony, the cutting of a covenant in the ancient Near Eastern culture. So that will be our final one for the, this year. And it's the, the purpose focusing here is to set the stage for the new year, how to pray and declare with greater effectiveness based upon the realities of the scriptures pertaining to the blood covenant. So I've just covered the next three three weeks with you. Mario, anything more you want to share before we sign off? Yes, I'd like to invite those that want to join us. We have a very special night to celebrate Israel in the South Florida area, November, I'm sorry, January 11th. Uh, it will be hosted at uh, dear friends of ours, an Orthodox synagogue at Boca Raton Synagogue in Boca Raton, Florida. And we'll have our dear friend, Ambassador David Friedman. Terry, if you can put the flyer uh, on the screen. This is uh, the Latino Coalition for Israel co-hosting with the Boca Raton Synagogue, the Christian Jewish South Florida Night to Celebrate Israel. For more information, you can just um, 
jot down that link or look at the World Prayer Network website to register. We're having a special. The event is free of charge. We are having a special VIP reception that you get to meet Ambassador David Friedman. For those of you that are interested, please let us know and sign up or invite your friends in the South Florida area. Back to you, Jim. Now, any of you that can make it to that, uh, David Friedman is exceptional, exceptional. I've said before, he's just one of my favorites, uh, a former ambassador to Israel from the United, United States. Uh, and once again, I want to announce again about Frank Kaser's book. Uh, I don't happen to have one right now here in front of me, but Frank Kaser's book called 65 Wisdom Principles for Christian Political Activists. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian. If, you're, uh, if you care about our nation, your kids, your grandkids, your community, you are a political activist. And so this is a brilliant book. We offered it last time. Once again, we do need to limit it, unfortunately, to one or two books per person. And for a donation of any amount, it helps us fund the World Prayer Network. You can order those books by going to Wellversed, that's with a D, Wellversedworld. Dot org, wellverseworld.org. And there on the homepage, you'll see a picture of Frank Kaser's brand new book. It just came out. He just mailed me one. I haven't even gotten it uh, yet. So I'm eager for you to have that book. And Tristan Tang on our, on our staff is working vigorously as we speak, trying to get those to you, if we can, before Christmas. That's the attempt. And he's paying, we're paying a higher pour at postage to try to get those to you. Uh, in a timely fashion. Thank you so much. Mario, I'm going to cap off right now with just a prayer for us all as we sign off. Father God, thank you for the enormous privilege we have of being at the foot of the cross. No Jesus, no salvation. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua, for the sacrifice that washed us, cleansed, cleaned us, sanctified us, justified us from our sins. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for entering into this messy world and being willing to enter into us and empower us and equip us and be the grand comforter to us in a world that is pretty challenging right now. We thank you, Father, for your love of this globe. You love this world. You love the people in it. You love every person you have created. Thank you for being the God who's compassionate and loving and caring. We are so grateful to be called followers of you. We love your word. We love what you have done for us. And we end this call by saying, thank you, Father. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Blessings as you go. We'll see you in just uh, what, three or four exciting nights. Go in the